And so I've had to come to this point, and it's been a struggle, where I've come to think and to consider from God's perspective, especially when it comes to understanding his blessing over my life. That's what I want to shortly talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about the blessing of the Lord. And I've had to totally rethink, friends, the grace of God. I've had to totally rethink it. And let me just show you then, perhaps, how I've come to that point. Everything, friends, that now relates to us in our new life in Christ must be understood by what occurred before and what occurs after the cross. Everything to do with God and us relates to what happened before the cross and what happens after. To our south side, this is before the cross. This is time where time began, this is the Old Testament, and here we come to 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. And here we have now our existence through to the northern wall, which is the end of time. This was the episode where you had to do what God said as far as obedience to the law. And this is the side here where we receive from God out of what he has done for us through his grace. So if we can just sort of keep that picture in our mind, that would be helpful. The Old Testament sometimes is a hard book to read, especially if you get into Leviticus and you start spinning your wheels and you get bogged down with laws and statutes and responsibilities and obligations because the Old Testament is basically an old covenant or an agreement made between man and God which is conditionally applied to us by our obedience. Let me just say that again. The Old Testament portrays the Old Covenant or an old agreement or an agreement between man and God which is conditionally applied to us by our obedience. Anything that was gained from God in the Old Testament was determined, predicated, and based upon man's obedience to God. In the New Testament, it's a little different. In the New Testament, we have a new covenant or an agreement between God and man. Not initiated by man to God, but between God and man, which is unconditionally applied to us by the obedience, not of us, but by one man whom the Bible says was Jesus. In the Old Testament, and under the system of law, it was what you had to do, what you must do. But here in the New Testament, in this age in which we live, it is what Christ has done. It is what he has achieved. It is what he has uh, purposed and fulfilled, not on his behalf or for himself, but for others. And this is the age... And this is the dispensation in which we particularly live in. Would you turn to Deuteronomy 28? Please, I want to show you this. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 15. We won't read the 15 verses, but maybe just a couple. Scroll to Deuteronomy 28. Whatever you do, just get there. Here we go. Deuteronomy 28. Verse 1. Now it shall come to pass, if... Those ifs are always a, a, a nuisance. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently... Obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments. That is a tall order. Uh, just reading that, I flunk. Uh, reading that, that totally discourages me because it's not just a partial amount of fulfilling. 
It's not a partial amount of observation. If I make 99%, I still fail. But here it is. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God would set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and shall overtake you. That's good. Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And it goes on in the verses following to talk about all the various aspects of blessing that would come upon the people of God if they fully observe to fully obey all that God had fully said. And that's a high call. That's a really high call. It talks about material blessing. It talks about constant daily blessing. It talks about blessing of protection and care. It talks about blessing of prosperity. It talks about blessing of godly identity. It talks about blessing with multiplied abundance. And it also talks about blessing of authority and honor. That's what came to the people of God. Okay, so where are we? Oh yes, we were talking about blessing. We were talking about obedience. We were talking about hard yards. We were talking about observing carefully to do all that he had said. We are talking about labor. We are talking about responsibility. It's, we're talking here about what we should do, what we ought to do, what we have to do, what you had to do, what is your responsibility, what is your obligation, what is your duty, what, duty, what is your duty and what you have to give. In other words, if it's going to be, it's going to be up to me. Does this sound familiar to you? I hope it isn't. But I believe for many Christians, I believe this is how it sounds to you. I've got to do this. I should do this. I ought to do this. I have to do this. I had to do that. It's my responsibility. It's my obligation. It's my duty. It's, I have to give because they said I had to. I have to. I don't want to, but I need to just to make sure the insurance is right for later on. If that sounds familiar to you, friends, we are still back here in the Old Testament trying to please God. We're still trying to work our way into his favor. We're still trying to get God on side. It's almost as if we're wrestling with God. And we said, God, I will not let you go until you bless me. And I'm going to hang on until you bless me. I'm, I'm afraid, friends, that uh, a lot of my Christian life was built on that sort of philosophy. I worked hard. I prayed hard, I read hard, I witnessed hard, I lived hard. I was committed, friends. I was committed, I was dedicated, I tell you. No question about it. I was that holy, it was ridiculous. And it was also flesh. If anybody deserved to be blessed, I did. Here I stood, right here, doing all these hard yards. It was my responsibility and I was observing to do carefully all his commandments and I was diligent and I was obeying. I wasn't bucking. I wasn't backsliding. I was doing all he commanded and I was waiting for the blessings to come and nothing was even overtaking me. And I got so disillusioned because I was doing all the right things. Glenn and I bought a treadmill last year because we needed to. I mean, I needed to, sorry. Anyway, we got this treadmill. You know, I've walked a long distance on that thing since November. I do 4K a day. It takes me about 36 minutes. I, uh, the, the distance 4K is from our place to Woolworths and back again. That's 4K. I do that every day. I'm as fit as a Mallee bull. Don't believe a lie. Anyway, I, I, I have walked a long way. I've travelled a long distance, I've done some hard yards, I've used up a lot of energy, I've used up a lot of time, I've uh, applied a lot of endeavour, but I've got nowhere. I haven't even walked across the room. 
And I was thinking about this, and it so portrays sometimes our Christian life. We're doing all the right things. We're, we're walking flat out. We're using up energy, stamina. We are doing the right things. We are, we are offloading. And we, 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 you know, all that sort of jazz and so forth. And it's like a Christian treadmill. We're really moving. But actually, we're not getting anywhere. But we're doing all the right things anyway, aren't we? So we should be happy with that. You get my drift? We've got to get off the treadmill <laughs> and get into the grace of God. We've got to get into something which brings satisfaction both to God and to us by having to get away from this thing of working into the favour of God. I'll tell you what the blessing and the awareness of his presence does to us, friends. Let me tell you this. It's a barrier against all the things that people can label us with. It's a resistance to that. Offences can come. But the Bible says, I think it's in Psalm 119, Great peace have those that love your law or your statutes or your commandments, Lord, because nothing will offend them. Nothing will offend them. When you have the presence and blessing of God in your life, friends, it is a resistance to the disease that might kill others God promises something beyond that or he promises blessing and healing and deliverance to you. When the devil will attack you, friends, you don't have to succumb to those attacks and over, be overcome by depression or chronic fatigue or anxiety or fear. You have some means of resistance against those things because of his presence, his blessing. When his presence is in your life, and his blessing is there, friends. You're able to overcome temptation and all the wiles of the devil, the lies of the devil, and you're able to get your mind fixed on God and you're able to think like God and be a victor and not a one who is conquered. These are the things, some of the things that come to those who have taken Christ into their life and they are living the life that he has caused them to live. And it's not because of what I have done, it's because of what he has done. You know, friends, the only thing that I can bring to, the t to God's table regarding gaining forgiveness from Him, regarding salvation from Him, the only thing that I can bring to the table of God regarding my Christian life and what I want Him to do in my life and what He wants to do in my life the only thing that I can bring to the table is not good works, not endeavour, nothing else. It's just my sin. That's the only thing I can bring to the table of God. My sin. My transgression, my iniquity, my past. All the things that really are not helpful to me as far as my sinful nature and activity is concerned. Both the Bible says and... Uh, it's interesting. Thank you. Um, thank you, Donnie. You're stealing so much this morning. It says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself. Can you say that? It's not of myself. Say it again. It's not of myself. It is not of myself. It is the gift of God. Say that. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Oftentimes in the past, I used to think that applies to salvation. But now I've got to work out my salvation with fear and trembling and here I go. Grace starts me off. Grace maintains me on the way through. And grace will see me out through the curtain at the end of my days. It is all his endeavour. It's all his grace. It is all what he has done. You know, every blessing from God under the New Testament covenant is unconditionally applied to us because of Jesus. It's unconditionally applied to us because of the obedience of Jesus. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, who is Jesus, many were made righteous. 
That is a powerful verse. I was just thinking about this this morning. <clears throat> In the Old Testament, every person who had sinned and who failed God had to pay a high price and get the best of the flock and bring it to God. And for that one transgression, they had to slay that one animal. And it was sufficient for that one occasion. That's all. If they flunked again next day, they had to repeat the cycle and go through the whole process. They had to outlay again, go and buy the best of the flock, make sure there was no imperfections, no marks, no defects. They had to get that thing and bring it to the priest and they had to slay the animal because every covenant in the Bible is undertaken and underscored by blood being shared. Something had to be given Something had to pay the price of life for life. There was a substitutionary work always involved in covenant dealings throughout the scripture. But the tragedy of living in the Old Testament was you had to keep it up. You had to keep it up. And your sin wasn't cleansed. It wasn't dealt with. The root wasn't taken away. The, the, the motivating factor of that sin wasn't dealt with. It was just covered. Just covered like an umbrella on a rainy day. Just covers you, that's all. Doesn't get rid of the rain, it just covers you. And I was just thinking how that in the New Testament, God saw the dilemma of man down through the ages and we come to the cross of Jesus Christ. And here we find <clears throat> that God the Father predetermined in his son who was slain before the foundation of the world to be the Lamb of God. And I was just thinking again, how that even from his birth, when Jesus was born in the manger, I may have shared this with you, how that, the how that the angels told the shepherds, they were the first, I think, to know about the birth of Jesus, and, and the angels said, go, go see the, the Christ child, the baby, born, uh, the baby born, go see him. And when the shepherds came in, it must have been an absolute shock to them to see this one who was wrapped in swaddling clothes, laying in a manger. And I've shared this with you before because this is how it really was at that time. The shepherds were well aware, and, and the priestly shepherds were also well aware, that when it came to the time of sacrifice, they would take a little lamb. Now, you know what it's like just to pick up a little. You've seen it on the, on the movies. You've seen, he gets a little lamb, and you oh, sweet little thing. Yeah, you know. It's just laying there, and it's just behaving. It's so gorgeous, little thing, you know. They used to get a little lamb, an innocent little thing like that, a gorgeous little creature of God, defenseless, beautiful, so lovely. They'd wrap it in cloths to stop the struggle and they would lay the lamb in a manger prior to slaughter. And they would take the lamb from the manger, take it out and slaughter it as a substitute for wayward people. And when the shepherds came in to see Jesus, they must have got the shock of their life because here was this little baby laying in a manger wrapped in swaddling cloths. And they looked at that little child and they said, he is ready for sacrifice as a substitute. That's powerful, friends. That is so powerful. And Jesus embraced that from eternity past. He, he accepted that. And then at 30 years of age, uh, when he was coming toward the Jordan and, and John was baptizing, suddenly John turned and above all the others, he recognized someone who was unique and he screams out aloud in his camel's hair and with locusts falling out of his face. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who who takes away the sin of the world. And here we have a demonstration of the best that God could ever give in his son. Pure, spotless, innocent. Jesus, the Lamb of God, coming to die as an eternal substitute for everybody and for everybody's sin, both past, both past present and future. We go that way, aren't we? Future. And the death of Jesus as my personal and your personal substitute not only covers your sin, but friends, it cleanses your past sin. 
It cleanses your present sins and it cleanses your future sins right now in Jesus' name. And you are perfect before God. You stand before God, absolutely perfect, cleansed, released, blessed because of the fact Jesus paid the price for you. And the blessing of God overtakes you.